Good morning, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 23rd, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know that I say this every week, and this week uh, I pretty much mean it. How's that? We do have quite a bit to cover, so I'll go ahead and get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. I don't get compensated for this free endorsement. How'd this get started? I think um, in Talladega Nights they talked about getting all jacked up on Mountain Dew. I think that's where it got started. stuff. Anyway, no compensation for that, but if PepsiCo, you're out there, hey, I'm looking for a sponsor. Red Bull said so I was too fat. All right, what are we talk about? Well, let's talk about the fact that you can lose money trading, and all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That's what disclaimer is all about. Uh, do me a favor, throw me a bone. Sometimes more people register and or show up for these uh, webinars then there are reviews so some of you guys are holding out on me so throw me a bone put me a review up at amazon.com even if you just agree with everyone else uh, that's fine because there are a few um, there's a couple stinkers on out there that have nothing to do with the actual book they didn't even read the book all right what we talk about I want to bring up the subject of major bow ties and um, ironically this was in the planning before today's uh, slide took place, and, and I wouldn't get too excited about today's slide just yet. We'll talk about that. But major bow ties are important to keep an eye on, um, as is other major transitional patterns. Bow ties are easier to recognize and show, but you also need to pay attention to other sort of um, transitional patterns. That'll make more sense in a few minutes. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about tripping over the nickels. We've got an update on that uh, while going for the dollars. I want to get into the whys of partial profits, talk a little bit about uh, continuing the good stock selection, how that uh, continues to win. But uh, instead of me just telling you about everything, let's just hop right into it. Now, bear with me. Some of you, your eyes may be glazing over because you've seen this chart a thousand times. But... It's important to keep an eye on this chart. And this is a, it's a little dated. It's about a year old, maybe slightly older. But this is a weekly chart of the S&P 500. And what I'm showing here is these major and minor bow tie sell and buy signals. And we had just come off an all-time high in 1999. And then we had this major sell signal on a weekly chart. Remember the market bottomed out for a couple of years in 2000, 2003 and then we had this major buy signal coming off of the lows and as you can see you had a pretty nice sell off after the sell and you had a pretty good run up after the buy and then believe it or not at the end of 2007 that's why I'm often I saw with a client yesterday I started talking about the bear market of 2007 he says well don't you mean 2008 and I'm like well yeah, but it began late in 2007. We actually had a weekly bow tie down right at the end of 2007, and we actually started getting some short signals uh, shortly there before. And uh, anyway, you had a pretty serious slide after that. This major buy took a while to form, so you would have been a little late to the table, but still, you'd have gotten in at a level, um, oh, about less than half of where we are now. So, so far, it's been a pretty good run. Ever since now, my point is your major buys and your major sells come after major bottoms. So in this case, it was an all-time high. In this case, it was an all-time high. In this case, it was a 13-year low, and in this case, five or six-year low. I forget how many. But the more years, the more important. Now we did have a minor. This, believe it or not, is not a sell, although it looked like it was going to turn into one. The market turned around and went right back up. We did have a minor sell a while back uh, in 2011. Minor because it's not coming off of all-time highs or multi-year highs. And then now, obviously, the market is up here somewhere. So if we do get, especially on the weekly chart, a bow tie down, then that would be concerning. So I'm not predicting it. I don't know when it will happen. Sooner or later, it will happen. Sooner or later, we'll have another bear market. Uh, but hopefully, that will be a long time from now and later in this presentation I'm going to talk about waiting for a signal so at least wait for some sort of signal maybe on a daily chart at the least 
Um, and if you remember 2009, when the, mar when the bottom happened around March, this spike type of bottom that we had here, there were a plethora of buy signals long before this uh, weekly ever came to uh, fruition. Okay. Um, okay, Martin, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, this week's nickel report. I came up with this graphic. And yeah, tripping over the nickels while going for the dollars is an old hedge fund adage. But I um, downloaded this uh, graphic and I put my little nickel triple ha uh, hazard in there. I just love this graphic. and It's pretty cool. And we've been having quite a few lessons about this. And I see this happen all the time. And in this particular case, this was a stock I recommended a while back. And um, I got a client was complaining uh, recently because he got a bad fill in this day. And I think he was out about 50 cents extra, 50 cents higher than he wanted. So I told him when it was up in the mid-30s here, said, I'll make you a deal. I'll buy all those shares back from you plus that 50 cents, okay, which uh, around 27.50 or whatever the case may be. I'll buy those shares for you. Just, just, just sell them to me, and I'll do that for you and make good on that deal, okay, help you out a little bit, help a brother out, right? Well, my point is, this stock has made a significant run, and who in their right mind wouldn't buy a stock in their mid twenties when it was trading at the in their mid thirties? Okay, so obviously I was tongue in cheek on that, but my point is that sometimes your best fills or your worst fills. Phil says that's what stock limits are for. I'm going to say no, because let's say you put it a stock. Oh, Unless you're going to use a very stop limit, let's say you want to enter here, unless you put your limit up way up here, okay, and you're willing to get that skittish, and stop limit is a bad idea. Uh, we talked a few weeks back in our Nichols report where someone was, uh, I forget the exact math, but it was like they were trying to enter at 50, and I think they had like 52 as their stop limit, and the stock blew right past them and kept on going. I think it might have been AERI which so far, knock on wood, has been a pretty big uh, winner for us. Okay, So I'm going to disagree with you, uh, respectfully disagree on that, unless you're going to use a very wide limit order. So again, sometimes your worst fills can turn into your best trades. And here's the deal. If people want the stock, if there is demand for the stock, then you are competing with other people to get in that stock, okay? So the fact that you get a bad fill, that might tell you that there is demand for the stock. Not every bad fill will turn into a big, huge winner like this. And this hasn't become a huge winner just yet, but it's not bad. That didn't poke in the eye is what I say. But don't worry so much about the nickels and focus instead on the dollars. Now, there is no free lunch, okay? There are a lot of costs in this business. There will be some stops. I'm sorry, there will be some slippage and frictional costs. But again, a lot of times you're going to find that your best fills or your, well, hang on one second, your best fills or your worst fills, okay? Meaning that you get a bad fill, but there's a reason why you got a bad fill because there's demand for the stock. I used to work with a guy years ago. I worked at uh, Keesler Air Force Base many years ago and one of the sergeants that, that we were working with, we were building a simulator and that's back in my programming days and he, uh, he like me, loved to eat and, and he dealt, we had a little Chinese restaurant we'd always go to but I'd asked him to go a lot on many days he'd say um, he was, he'd say uh, too expensive, cause money, cause money uh, so that's got me thinking of cost money. So uh, since it costs money, you have to make hay while the sun shines. Okay, and what I mean by this is trading costs. You're going to have losses. You're going to have slippage. And there's a plethora of things that are going to happen that are going to be expensive. But when you have the opportunity to squeeze out additional profits using discretion, go in and watch last week's webinar where we talked about that. You got a bit of a windfall profit overnight. You pass the initial profit target, and the position continues to run. And then, by all means, stick with it, okay? 
as opposed to just taking it on the open. The other thing, too, is, and this is really hard for a lot of people, this is why I often show these drawdown charts on a big winner where you're up 20%, then you're only up about 10%, then you're up 40%, then you're only up about 30%, then you're up 50%, then you're only up 25%, and show how the stock stair steps higher, but along the way, you will have some drawdowns and some retracements, and hopefully your stop is wide enough to ride those out. And my point being, a lot of people, when they get to about 100%, they're like, wow, that's just plenty. I'm just going to take profits there. And my feeling is, no, let it go, because you don't know if it's going to turn into 200% or 400% or 600%, okay? So you want to ride those long-term trends out. It's never enough. How do you decide how much you're willing to be badly filled? Well, if the stock is liquid enough, and in the case of that one prior, it, it was liquid enough going in, but it did kind of dry out, dry up a little bit. But if the stock is trading above the trigger, then a lot of times I'll just use a stop market order, and I get filled when I get filled. And if I get a crappy fill, I don't care, okay? So how much is I willing to get filled? Well, as long as the stock is very liquid, it doesn't matter because you're not going to get that bad of a fill. Now, obviously, if you are looking to trade into a position, and let's say you've got your little pullback set up and your entry's here, and it, it's bid way up here or something or a gap way up there, then you would ignore that trade. But if you let the market open and it starts trading uh, intraday, let's say this is the intraday chart, say your entry's here, and intraday the stock's doing this, then eh, put that order in and don't worry about it. Use a stock market order. You know, let the market open to make sure it doesn't gap above it. And then don't worry about your slippage in here. Don't trip over the nickels going for the dollars. You could also, and this is a can of worms I hate to open because you're going to have to figure this out on your own, but most brokerages offer contingency orders. So you could put a little algorithm in there a little if then type of thing to say okay well if it's above if it's at or above the entry and if the bid is at or above the entry meaning it's a real market and the um, let's say the ask or whatever is below a certain threshold in here okay whatever that slippage you determine might be then go for it okay you could program that into your brokerage account um, Again, if it's liquid enough, just use a stop market entry order, and you end up um, uh, hitting that, uh, hitting the ask, okay? Now, let's talk about, okay, before we jump into that, Martin has a question. Did you ever trade a breakout setup system, uh, and if did, why did you stop trading it? I have traded a little bit of everything over my career and I've lost a lot of money until I settled upon my very simple trend following short to intermediate or swing to intermediate term system that I have been talking about publicly over the last oh I don't know 15 years or so but yeah I tried a little bit of everything uh, why did I stop try trading a breakout system because you lose your ass with breakout systems. Okay, write that down. Uh, yeah, long before everyone had a computer on your desk or the desk, uh, you could probably trade a breakout system. In a market like 2000 or early 2000, I should say, but a market like 1999, you could probably trade a breakout system and do okay. Now, more often than not, breakouts tend to fail. So that's why I like to trade reversion to the mean in the direction of the trend. In other words, I like to trade pullbacks, okay? So, yeah, breakouts can work, but for the most part, you're going to have a very abysmal um, percent correct, and it's going to be very tough, okay? Now, longer-term trend following is very low percent correct, too, but if you combine it with shorter-term swing trading and you take those partial profits, which leads us into a really good segue to what I want to talk about today, is... The combination of those two helps to control those risks. It helps to control the longer-term inaccuracy, okay? So if we have a market, just to, just to 
digress just for one second or two here, or maybe a minute. If we have a market in a solid uptrend, if we have a market in a solid uptrend that pulls back, okay, we know there's a pretty good chance this market can make that reversion to the mean move, maybe back to the old highs where we could take some profits. But we don't know if it's going to resume that longer-term uptrend. But if we do take partial profits when that occurs and we trail our stop, then we could sit back and let things unfold, okay? So you never know whether or not you're going to – there's three things that are going to happen. One – Actually, four. Okay, let's say you don't, you never get triggered. If this market continues to drop, you never get triggered. Well, that's a lesson on entries. We've had plenty of those. Okay, but now let's say you do get triggered. Three things are going to happen. Okay, um, you're going to get stopped out at a loss, or you might get stopped out. Let's say it rallies up a little bit and then comes in. Then you might get stopped out at a loss a little bit smaller than you uh, were willing to give it. Okay. It's going to hit the profit, initial profit target, and you're going to get that stop to break even, and you're going to scratch out on the remainder. Or, and this is the big hopefully, you get that partial profit target, and it keeps on going, and you trail a stop, and it turns into a longer-term winner, okay? When we get in the choppy market, and we have a half a dozen positions do this, trigger, profit target, stop out, trigger, Private target stop out, trigger, private target stop out. You get the idea, right? I get a lot of clients. Hey, Dave, why don't we exit 100%? Okay, there. Now, when we get a market, trigger takes off, trigger takes off, trigger takes off. I get a lot of clients. Dave, why are we taking profits when we could just ride out this longer-term trend? Well, the answer is you don't know. I mean, obviously, you don't know if it's going to be a, a loss to begin with. But let's say that it turns into a winner. It's either going to be this or this, right? Okay, or some combination thereof. So you don't know. So you take those partial profits, and you hopefully ride out what turns into a longer-term trend. Okay? So it allows you to have your cake and eat it, too. Hopefully get that short-term gain and hopefully capture that longer-term gain. Uh, the question is often asked, and we've done quite a few shows on this. We talked about the R meaning risk versus the R versus reward. And the question comes up is, is half enough? Okay. And half is enough for this second loaf. We're going to look at a couple of big winners in just one minute. And, yeah, it would be nice if you had a full position on, but you don't know going into it that it's going to turn into such a great position. Okay. If you do, then obviously you would have a full position. But you don't know, and no one knows. Okay. So half is still going to, be, going to be enough, and then you could always swing trade around longer-term positions. Now, this is, this is a little bit advanced, I guess, uh, 201, but let's say you get long a position and it pulls back, and let's say you took 200. Let's say you had, let's just do 200 shares and make the math easy, okay? Well, let's say you take 100 off here, okay? Well, it pulls back again, begins to rally. Well, you put 100 back on, okay? So if you get a market that kind of stair steps higher, and this doesn't happen often, but sometimes it does. You'll get a few chances to rinse and repeat, meaning you can put shares on, take shares off, put shares on, take shares off. And what you end up doing is swing trading around a core position. Now, in my trading service, I'll show the original position. And if it sets up again, I'll tell my peeps, hey, it's set up again. But to make things easy, I won't go in and, and put in put it in as a brand new setup for an add-on trade or an add-back trade, I guess would be a better way of putting it. Um, in hindsight, I probably should do that to make my longer-term track record do, be, uh, look a heck of a lot better. Um, but I don't. I mean, I think the people who know me know that this works longer term. They know it's not perfect. They know it's not a get-rich-quick scheme, so I'm not worried about trying to look impressive uh, and, and do those kind of things. So I just basically say, look, it's set up again. You want to get back in uh, with a piece. It's a good idea. You know, wink, wink, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, okay? When you put that 100 back on, what stop loss 100 do you use, 1%? Well, you're going to use um, – 
you're going to treat it as a swing trade. You're going to figure out where your stop should be based on that swing trade. And I guess, yeah, to answer your question, it's going to be half of that position size, whatever that is, okay? So 1%. Now, you could maybe put on uh, a little bit smaller amount uh, during that run, okay? And then the price of the security in the case of a long side is going to go up a little bit. The volatility is going to increase, okay? So I would say 1% would probably be a maximum for that add-on trade, okay? Now, we kept the math easy saying it was 200, 100, 200, 100. Well, that number is going to change as the price of the stock gets higher and higher. And if volatility is increasing with trend, which it usually does and which we're actually looking for, an expansion in both volatility and trend, okay? So your position size is going to be a little bit smaller on those add-on trades. And I would use, uh, Eric, you're right, I would use 1% as maybe a maximum of your portfolio for those add-on trades, okay? Now, getting back to our little example, we just um, had a few minutes. I'll, I'll put a second chart in here just to show you. So your entries around here, your initial profit target is here. And then hopefully, and I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully it keeps on keeping on. And I didn't know this coming into today. I was a little nervous coming into today, actually, with some of these charts and, and uh, spreadsheets in here. But this one right now, at this particular moment in time, is having a pretty good day. It's at 36.40, okay? So this bar is now up here, okay? I didn't know it would keep on going. Had I known it would keep on going, I would have kept half of my position overnight uh, for, or last couple nights or last couple days, and we'd be up here right now. But you don't, okay? And getting that stop up to break even, it puts you in a very powerful position because barring overnight gaps, comes down, scratches you out. Well, at least you made something overall in the trade better than poking the eye. And if this thing keeps running, then you're going to stop out at a profit. Okay, let's come back next week and let's say I'll stop way up here. Well, then you'll stop out at a decent profit on the trade. And it's okay to give up some of those open gains. We don't know when it's going to end. Okay, 3640 might be the exact top on this stock. I have no earthly idea if it is or will be. I hope it's not. I hate to use the word hope, but I hope it's not. I hope, uh, I don't know, 200 is the exact top or 300, 400, okay? But the point is you want to trail that stop higher. You want to let the market make the decision for you. All these things I preach about, let that unfold, and hopefully you're going to be pleasantly surprised a few weeks, a few months, or even a few years from now with this particular stock or any other stock for that matter when you are – uh, you transition over from longer term trend following to um, I'm sorry when you transition from let me scratch these out just in case you could see them <laughs> I'm such a tease uh, as you transition from the sweet trade to the longer term trade now I wanted to show you the open portfolio uh, for the main reason of we did have we hit the initial profit target on this one and so far it really hasn't worked out too greatly on the second low we hit the initial profit target on this one, and this, it actually was bigger than uh, the 1,000 or the 1% of 100K uh, account that we're using on this one, okay? And that's because it gapped down. And then if you watch last week's presentation, uh, it, it actually would have turned into about $1,600, an extra $300 on that one. But it's an open trade. We'll see how things shake out. Here's another one that hit the initial profit target. Anything that's in white has hit the additional profit target. And so far, knock on wood, this one's turned into a pretty good trade today notwithstanding. But you can see it's starting to move. We don't have any big windfalls in here. I wish we did. But who knows, okay? This is now at, uh, what is this, 36.40, okay? So this number is going to look a little bit better today. But I just want to show you these partial profits in here. And we don't know what's going to happen on the second loaf, but that's where the real money is going to be now if we go back to uh, if we go back to recent times I went back about three or four months and I took a snapshot of the spreadsheet and these are the stocks as they stopped out the recent the, the most recent stock we stopped out was NCR and then before that was SLCA and then this one so one two three four five six seven stocks the last seven stocks that we stopped out of you can see the NCR on the first loaf we made a thousand dollars well, what do we make on the second 
of that position. Well, we actually lost a tiny bit. Now, had I known it would have come down here, remember it's a short, and only gone down to that initial profit target before going back up, then you would have exited at 100%, and you would have made 1,000 plus 1,000 or 2,000 on a trade. But you didn't know that, okay? And this one, we trailed it slightly, and we lost a little bit less than 1,000 uh, on both halves of the shares, 2,000 total, okay? This one, this is Pandora. We made 1,000, and then we just made a little bit on that, made a little bit more than 1,000. But the reason I want to bring this up is this shows you that if you take partial profit, sometimes you make a little and scratch out, okay, like you did on these three trades here, okay? And sometimes you make a little and then you make a home run, like this particular trade here. Um, if you go back to that open portfolio two slides back, you'll see we have one up here. Okay, that's a half a loaf on a trade that required some discretion, but it's up about 500%, okay, closing in on a $30,000 gain on a 100K account. So that's how the second loaf can pay off. Some people say you don't have enough on. Well, if you can make 28% return on your entire account and a 500% return on the actual stock, then that's a pretty good uh, that's a pretty good number. Okay, so you can see that if you add all these up, you did you did print money, but you did okay. You had a couple of losing trades, one, two, actually three losing trades, and a couple of trades that made or three trades that made a little money and scratched out. But you allowed for this home run, and hopefully we'll have more than one or two a quarter in here. That's my goal. We have one or two a week, maybe, right? But I wanted to show you the taking of the partial profits and the importance of that. Psychologically, now people often ask me, Dave, is your money management psychological or is it statistical? And my answer is yes. Okay. The psychological part is that I'm able to get that short-term need for fulfillment. Okay. My need for Reward shorter term, the microwave society we talked about a few weeks back, where I want it and I want it now, okay? I want that short-term reward, okay? So that solves that part of my, is it Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Freshman psychology rears its ugly head. There's also this need to be right and the need to be right big. And in a grandiose way. So hanging on to that position for that home run kind of feeds that part of my ego. So hopefully a year from now I can come in and show you some from that open portfolio and say, hey, remember this one from uh, about a year ago this time, back in last January? Now it's up a 1,000%. Okay? So that's the ego part of it. And the statistical part is a solid money management plan that has somewhat limited risk, somewhat being a key word in that sentence, and the potential for unlimited gains, okay? So we made eight times the amount on the second loaf that we did on the first loaf of the trade, okay? Now, if you look at it as a dollar risk, you made 14 times that risk if you look back at this big trade up here. Okay, So the partial profits is vitally important in making the methodology work. And, and the reason I'm kind of beating the dead horse of this or often talk about this is I've been on and off throughout the years. I've been parts of uh, institutional uh, projects. And one of them that I was on a while back they had some, some brainiacs that were on the project, some very, very smart people, and a lot of well-known people, too. But to my surprise, they weren't really into this. They were maybe more statistically oriented or shorter term oriented. They didn't see the value of taking your partial profits and holding on to that longer-term winner. And that allowed me to have my cake and eat it too. And sometimes if you go back to these trades here, you can see that you don't get rich, okay, if you're only making 1% and scratching out. But it does help to mitigate, 
not completely mitigate, but it does help. Every time you make $1,000, you can scratch out $1,000 of these losses in here. So it does help to get rid of some of those losses. And if you get in a choppy market where you make a little, scratch out, make a little, scratch out, stop out, stop out, stop out, make a little, scratch out, make a little, scratch out, rinse and repeat, then you don't print money, and you might actually lose some money, and you might actually go into a drawdown, but you sort of mitigate those losses and kind of keep your head above the water. And what happens is if the market, let's say the market's doing this, and starts doing this, well, you'll start chopping out, and then what will happen is eventually you'll take fewer and fewer trades to where you're no longer taking them. The drawdown's going to look like this, okay? And, it, and then eventually it's going to flatten out because you're no longer taking any trades. But this will help to keep your head above the water when that transition is in place. Okay. Craig says, don't forget to touch on the service momentum list. Yesterday, VISN was up 45%, and today MRNA was up 14%. Those are windfalls, not to mention the initial solar pick, which was likely the trade of 2013. Thank you. Craig is, Craig is one of my favorite clients. Actually, every client of mine is my favorite client. But Craig's uh, very nice in that he often uh, points out some things like this. VISN. Yeah, uh, this one's one that triggered a while back. It took off uh, yesterday. Uh, this is my list from my stock selection webinar. And, and this could have easily turned into a list of stinkers. But it turned out to be a pretty cool list. And... The reason I want to keep harping on this is, is several fold, but one is that we had a pretty good offense going in. The importance of a good offense is find the stocks that are trending, find the stocks that are set up, and look the best. And this was the stocks that came straight out of the webinar. Now, it's interesting, these last three losing trades here were also the three losers from last week. And on this one here, nope, this one here, TCS, I think, this one actually went up about 20% and came back in, okay? So that would be one of those trades that hit the initial profit target and scratched out. But what I think I'm going to do for tracking purposes is I think I'm going to take out these three losing trades here, and they were three losing trades last week too. And then I'm going to continue to track this list to see what happens because these are no longer trending and viable uh, stocks because they're no longer trending. They rolled over. Now, the reason, the other reason I want to show you is this is what's possible. And this was on, uh, this was a webinar I did on 12-14, okay? Uh, and if you measured the market, 13, if you measured the market from there till now, it was up about 3.5%, okay? So, and looking for these inefficient stocks that are trending, and look good. You can see you have some gains of 20, 40, 50, 60, and almost 100%. Okay? So money management is important. And I just got through, I just spent 20 minutes talking about the importance of money management. But a good offense is also important, too. So you want to try to get into the best of the best stocks. Okay? And I'm going to probably continue to bring this list up in coming weeks. And I'm thinking about, I'll probably to scratch these three out. And what will happen is I'll manage this as a momentum list, and we'll uh, we'll see how that uh, shakes out. So, okay. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate that. Okay. Question days. Looked like you bought RLYP about 13, 14 days previous high. I thought it was many days. Too many days. Okay. What? Let's take a look at that. Okay. Uh, the entry. Let's take a look at the portfolio. The entry was 27.50, and I think the actual we were looking to get in around 27.25. Um, so yeah, it triggered around here, and he said that, well, was it at too many days of the pullback? And the answer is yes. If it had been a regular stock, it would have been too many days of the pullback. But with IPOs, initial public offerings, I'm a little bit more lenient. Also, take a look. This stock ran from 12 to 30 so it more than doubled over a short period of time so I'm willing to give that stock a little bit more correction in both depth okay and in time so as a general rule if a stock goes let's say 10 11 days or so 9 to 11 days or so without triggering or in that pullback if you're counting the pullback I should say okay 
9, 10, 11 bars. I'll usually take it off of my screen. In fact, there was another one that actually took off uh, shortly thereafter as soon as I took it off of my screen. But you have to have some kind of rules in place. But in IPOs and or volatile stocks that have huge moves, and this qualifies as a little bit of both, then I'm willing to give it more, more time. Now, for the short side, let's say you get a stock that's rolling over like this. Usually, your best trades are going to come after one or two bars of pullback in here. And if it keeps pulling back, pulling back, then usually after a while, I'll certainly take these off of my list because it seems like if something is going to implode because they slide faster than they glide, it should begin to implode quickly, and it shouldn't go up day after day after day after day after day uh, in that, okay, in that consolidation. So that might tell you that maybe the move lower is done, okay. But on the long side, especially in more volatile stocks and stocks that have made huge moves and are IPOs, I tend to be a little bit more lenient, okay. Keep in mind that there are general rules for what I do, and then in certain particular cases, we might bend those rules a little bit. But if you were looking at just a generic pullback, then yeah, after 12 days or so, or maybe even 10, 11 days, maybe you might not want to take the setup, okay? And it's not a perfect methodology, but... It's the best that I've found after many years of searching, as I often preach. Uh, i got some random thoughts. Some are new, some are old. Uh, again, you want to play it one day at a time, and don't get too caught up in anything. Uh, today's kind of an ugly day, and we'll look at the market here in just a few seconds. Uh, but don't get too caught up in the day-to-day. -day. Uh, we had a couple of days where the market sold off a little bit, and that's why I keep putting that... Uh, silly chicken in my uh, column because it's like as soon as the market sells off a little bit everybody's like aha I told you this is the top the sky is falling chicken little right and I've seen these predictions and these people who are calling a top for a long long time predict early and often right well wait for some kind of signal to occur before you rush out and call a top. Now, we talked about bow ties a little while ago. Wait for maybe a daily bow tie, a first thrust down, or at least wait for things to really settle down on a net-net basis. Now, the S&Ps, the S&P on a net-net basis, the Ps, have gone pretty much sideways for about a month, and we're going to look at all that in just a minute or two. So, yeah, they've lost a little bit of momentum, but they're just off of all-time highs. So give the market the benefit of the doubt. Even with today's action, if we have a percent and a half move higher tomorrow, which is not that big of a move in the market, okay, then the market would be back to new highs. Phil says, predict early and often, issue press release when, when right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I, I, I'm not going to play those games where – you just predict, 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 and eventually you get it right, and you make a big press release and get the band out, the marching band. Ooh, doo -doo -doo. Look, I called the top. Yeah, but you called 30 other tops <laughs> from 50% from lower, okay? Uh, I know I beat the dead horse on this quite often, but you want to err on the side of the trend, okay? Uh, there will be corrections. I actually put this in, I think, this morning, early this morning, before the future started sliding, okay, or might have been from last week. So, yeah, there will be perfect, uh, corrections. But what you want to do is let the ebb and the flow take you out and put you in, okay? What's going on right now? Well, we've been seeing some gold transitional setups and some bow ties. We'll talk about some of those in a few minutes, okay? So what did we get long? As promised in two uh, newsletters ago, I said today I would tell you what gold, we are long. We are long NG, okay, because we had a little transitional setup. And then there are some more transitional setups coming into the day. 
this one right here okay might be a big winner who knows and I'll show it to you over the next few weeks if it is okay uh, and keep in mind you could have what's called a rolling correction and this will take you out of the old longs and it might actually put you in new ones let's say we were long a consumer non durable or a retail stock what has happened in more recent times okay well they've rolled over and bow tied down and are looking pretty ugly we'll look at that too in just a few minutes so it might have knocked you out of these positions as losses but lo and behold maybe you might be short these particular areas now okay one of those losing trades I just showed you in that spreadsheet is now set up as a potential short so maybe the ebb and flow will get you out of old positions and put you in new ones or even put you in the same sector but on the other side okay so and if you do have these rolling corrections like I said it could possibly put you into some new shorts okay now Again, one day at a time, again, air on the side of the trend. Just make sure you really like the short setup before you take it. We had about four or five good-looking shorts recently, and I took about three out of, out of four of those. And then that, that other one turned out to be a big winner. But I didn't want to completely overload the portfolio on the short side as long as the market was looking pretty good. By the time that fourth or fifth short came up, the market early began, already began to turn around a little bit, and it's like, well, let me err on the side of the market, okay? When those other shorts were put on, at least on a net-net basis, the market had gone a little bit sideways, okay? So for the most part, you want to err on the side of the market. Don't try to outsmart the market. Never forget that we are followers, and I think you could only follow the market. There are no predictive indicators. But Dave, you just said that these bow ties, sometimes you get the bow tie off the all time highs and they make a major top. And Yeah, it does. But it's just showing you what's already in the market and what the market potentially has to do that it is a potential top. Now, it's worked fairly well over the last 30 years. That doesn't mean it's going to keep on working like it has. But it gives you an idea that maybe the trend has turned. And we don't know how far it's going to go. So if we treat, see a trend begin to turn as followers, we're going to follow that trend. And again, is the market at or near new highs? Then give it the benefit of the doubt. And the other thing is, continue to play that good offense. Become a better and better chart reader. Become a better and better stock picker. It's too bad there's not a webinar on that because that would be awesome, right? Show you how to pick these big winners. <laughs> So continue to play that good offense in 2014. Yes, focus on money management and position management and defense and all those important things, but have that really good offense going in. Make sure you can't stand it. If you see a setup, you're like, I can't stand it. I have to have this stock. Then go after it. If it's a stock where you just kind of shrug your shoulders, eh, let it go. Maybe it'll take off without you. Maybe it won't. All right, a couple of announcements. If you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, we're going to hop into the charts now. We're also going to, before we do that, we're going to look at the overall markets of sector action. But I'll be happy to start taking your stock picks. Uh, if you don't mind, if you're new to these webinars, just ask about one stock at a time. You could ask about 10, but just punch in the symbol, hit enter, and then punch in the next symbol. A um, couple of announcements here. I won't bore you too much with this. Uh, the stock selection webinar, as you know, was last uh, in December. And right now until January 31st, so about another week or so, if you sign up for a year of the service, you'll get the webinar free. The webinar, the cost of the webinar alone was $1,460, okay? And uh, the cost of the service is uh, $1,460 for a year. But you'll get those recordings free on that. I do have uh, the second volume of the Week of Charts available. It's about 30 hours. If you like these shows, then you'll love the, the uh, flash drives. Because I've got uh, all the shows consolidated on the flash drive. No downloading required. Pop it in your computer and you're good to go. My first two books are still relevant. If you're interested, go to my website uh, for more information on those. I have some other books I recommend. Check out my website, too. And everything else. Trading services, as you know, see my website for more than that. All right, enough announcements. Let's hop into these charts and let's start talking about these uh, things. When trading on the short side, can equities go to zero? Yes. What are those precautions not to select those plus expense dividends? Okay.
Well, you want equities to go to zero if you're short. Okay. Now, some people say that you could only make 100% on the short side. Well, if you have an orderly downtrend, which is a big if, you could certainly uh, rinse and repeat, do some of the things I talked about earlier, where you swing trade around that longer term position and pick up some extra uh, money along the way. Um, avoid stocks with big dividends. As a general rule, I'd say, yeah, yeah, you don't want to have to pay a dividend while you're short a stock. But here's the good news. Let's say you're short a stock, and this is why I don't really worry about the dividend too, too much. I mean, yeah, it could be a pain in the butt tax. Don't get me wrong. And it's hard to pay out money to somebody. But let's say we got a nice little Dave Landry set up or whoever set up, okay, and you get short, okay, and then let's say they pay a $1 dividend, okay, so you're short here. Well, usually, and usually being the key word in that sentence, when that stock goes XD, X dividend, that stock is going to drop a dollar, okay, so you just, you went up $1, in profits, but now you got to pay one dollar in profits. Okay, so net net, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Now, obviously, if the stock doesn't work out, it goes sideways or whatever, and you're in it a long time, yeah, you could end up paying dividends over a while. But for the most part, the stock is going to drop the same amount as the dividend. Arbitrage usually keeps that in check. Okay, usually be the key word in that sense. Sentence. Okay. All right, let's get out to these charts. And I won't spend too much time on the charts. We'll get to your good questions and good stock picks coming in. Well, most of them, except for a certain individual asking about those big thick stocks, even though he knows better. <laughs> And who would I pick on if he didn't show up, right? All right, let's take a look at the P's. <laughs> I'm already getting some no's. i got to find Nicholas. Yeah. Let's find Nicholas before we get started. Time CH. Let's get Nicholas ready, just in case. I think we need an electrocardiogram, too. Well, I'll find an electrocardiogram before we get to Nicholas. All right. Um, today's action is disappointing, to say the least, okay? in the peas. Uh, but it's not the end of the world, but the market has dropped down to the bottom of its trading range, basis of the peas. One important thing to do, and, and if you've been reading my recent newsletter, I've been talking a lot about forests versus trees. Okay, So if you go back to 2012, although it hasn't been a rout, there has been some bumping there has been some bumpiness along the way, but for the most part, squint your eyes. And you could can you see what's going on today? No. You can, this just looks like a little bit of, of some chop in here, okay? So the the uptrend's still intact. Let's not get too excited until we get a bow tie or something forming. Now, one thing I do like to do, and my buddies over at uh, Traders Toolbox often remind me of this, uh, Doug um, Newberry and Bill uh, McKinley, uh, they often talk about the 50-day moving average. And I usually don't put it on my charts until and unless the market gets in a bit of a slide. So a few weeks back, I put it on my charts, say, okay, where's the market? Where's the 50-day moving average? And so today, I plotted it just to see where we are. So we got a little ways to go for the 50-day moving average. And one thing you'll notice is usually – a lot of technicals will come together at the same point. So if the market does come down to the 50-day moving average, number one, it's not the end of the world, and number two, it'll just be right at this prior top of this breakout, which should provide some support for the market. So it would be a support level. So that's the 50-day moving average. Um, as I say quite often, and you could pick your own moving average. If you're newer to trading, and you need some kind of way to determine trend, then use daylight, meaning that the lows are greater than the, greater than the moving average. And except for this little kiss right here, you can see that you would have had a pretty good run in the S&P 500. You had a couple of days of daylight under the moving average, but then for the most part, came right back up. And most of your trading has been above the 50-day moving average, and you've had daylight, meaning that the 
lows are greater than the moving average. Okay. So daylight's a pretty cool concept. And it really can help you keep you on the right side of the market. You could pick whatever moving average you want and study that. Now, Howard's saying we're losing daylight. Yeah, we, we are. I mean, it's coming down here. But if it comes down and touches the moving average, it's not the end of the world. But this is where you might get a little bit more selective at your stock picking. Now, we haven't gotten to the NASDAQ yet. But the NASDAQ's been doing pretty good in spite of this S&P going sideways. And we had a lot of sectors, which we'll get to in a few minutes that have just gone straight up and have been phenomenal, okay? So in spite of the P's being a little flat, we have been picking up some longs in uh, certain technology areas, especially uh, biotech, okay, and uh, drugs that have been doing really well. Now, just for fun, why don't we put the bow tie moving averages in on a daily basis, and let's see what that looks like on the P's. And so far, even with today's action, they really haven't come in too much, okay? They turned down a little bit today, but I wouldn't get too excited about that just yet. Now, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ looks a lot better than the P's. As you know, it broke out recently. And it's given up a little bit of that, but it's only down about, oh, I don't know, a little bit more, three-quarters of a percent, a little bit less than one percent today. So it's certainly not the end of the world. It's just trading about where it was last week or so. And in this particular case, if you back the chart way, 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 way out and draw your arrow, so far, so good. Dave, how long can the market sustain itself looking like that? I have no idea. It, it might end tomorrow, it might end the day after tomorrow, it might end three years from now, it might end ten years from now, okay? You don't know, okay? I would say you don't care because we obviously care, but you can't worry about that, okay? Um, kind of an interesting story. I don't know if you guys will appreciate this or not, but um, I was in a sailboat race once, and, and it was nighttime, you know, I was sick as a dog. We got caught in a low-pressure system. We were off the coast of Texas, and we are headed towards Florida. And we had these two Texans aboard. They'd never, been aboard. they'd never been aboard a boat in their life. And they're, like, chewing tobacco, and then they're, like, uh, eating beef jerky, and I'm, I'm puking over the back deck. And, you know, I'm on the helm as much as I can hold on because the helm kind of helps to help seasickness if, if you're doing something and focusing on the horizon. Anyway, long story endless, I know too late. Every now and then, I'd have to, I just couldn't even be on the helm anymore. I was so sick, I'd have to hang my head over the back rail. So uh, they said, what, what should we do? And, uh, you know, I pointed out a rig in the distance, and I said, go to the light. And they made jokes, go to the light, the light is good. And I'm bleh, throwing up over the back of uh, the deck. And then a little while later, we got in a bunch of rigs, and at this point, I really wasn't worried about where the boat was headed. I just didn't want to hit a rig, and I just had—I was sick again, so I'm hanging over the back of the boat. And something somewhat profound happened. I said, uh, "They said, well, what do we do now?" And I said, "Well, just stay away from the light." And they started making jokes: "Stay away from the light. The light is bad." You know, like in poacher guys. Well, then it got quiet for a moment, and I'm and I'm and I'm like looking at them like what? And they both look at me kind of with a blank stare in their face and said, what if they're not lit? What if the rigs are not lit? What if the light burned out on the rig? And my answer was, don't worry about it. And, you know, I go back to throwing up. And they're like, well, what do you mean don't worry about it? So for the first time, these guys started getting a little nervous out there that, hey, you could actually die at an open ocean race like this, especially with a lot of obstacles in the way. And my point was, there's nothing you can do about it. So don't worry about it. So a light burns out on the rig. You're not going to see the rig in time to avoid it, especially given the weather conditions. So don't worry about it, okay? Now, I know it sounds a little crazy, but... If you know there's nothing you could do, then don't worry about it. That's a long-winded story 
we know that someday this market's going to crash, or we know that someday this market's going to roll over and go down. But you can't worry about it, okay? Now, hopefully that made a lot of sense. <laughs> I'm full of stories today. All right, NASDAQ coming in a little bit. Not the end of the world. Uptrend still intact. So far, so good. Yeah, let's take a look at the Rusty, okay? So, yeah, just don't worry about it. And you want to stay a trend follower as long as there's a trend to follow. Draw your arrows. What's the Rusty doing? Well, so far, it's going up, okay? Coming in a little bit today, uh, down about the same amount as the NASDAQ. No big deal. Don't worry about it. Okay, so far, longer term uptrend remains intact. This is a broad based index, 2,000 stocks. Okay, so for the most part, stocks in general have been headed higher. Now, today, notwithstanding, things have looked pretty good. You take a look at the fence, draw your arrow there, bang down brand new highs yesterday on an acceleration of trend. Uh, what else also did that? The, the semis yesterday uh, had a similar type. Of move, I don't see them. We'll get to them in one second. Oh, here they are, right there. There's a the semis. You see, banged out new highs with vigor. Now coming back in, already giving that up. But so what? So far, so good. There, uh, bonds have been hanging in there, which is kind of cool because I think if bonds began to implode in earnest, I would be nervous about this overall market. In fact, bonds actually made a bow tie off of multi-year lows. Well, everybody that probably knows that rates are going higher. Well, what are they doing now? They made a bow tie off of these multi-year lows. So far, so good for bonds. And we might have a bit of a Goldilocks environment where stocks are headed higher and bonds are headed higher. I know it's not good for those fixed income people, but it's great for us equity type of tree, uh, people. Anything technology related for the most part still looks pretty good in here. There's computer hardware just pulling back. In fact, tonight we'll probably see a plethora of setups. There's computer software so far. Just pull it back. Drugs have been absolutely on fire. Today we'd have a bit of a knockout move. I can tell right now I'm going to have my work cut out for me tonight. There's going to be a plethora of long side setups. And we're going to take them if and only if what? They begin to trigger. Drug delivery, biotech, anything drug related has been doing fantastic as of late. Now, all isn't rosy in the world. A couple of areas like restaurants, you can see, have kind of rolled over in here. Uh, media has lost quite a bit of steam in here as of late. You can see it might bow tie down soon. Also, consumer non-durables. We've been talking a lot about those guys. Have been looking a little ugly in here. Let's take a look at those guys. We have a bow tie off of all-time highs. That can be a significant signal, okay? Dave, what about the bow tie back here? Well, they bow tied, but then they went right back up. Okay, now they bow tied, and so far they're continuing to slide in here. Okay, so that's looking a little ugly. Retail is looking a little bit ugly in here. Retail has now officially bow tied down off of all-time highs. Now it doesn't mean that it's going to just implode from here. It doesn't mean that this is the mother of all tops, but all major tops will have a bow tie down, especially off of all-time highs. So it is going to be worth paying attention to. Now, if it starts going straight up tomorrow, then, hey, we dodged a bullet, and retail has it topped out. But so far, it's looking pretty ugly. So those are two ugly-looking sectors. For the most part, though, most areas look pretty good. Uh, selected metals, such as aluminum, have been melting up as of late. Gold has now made a bit sloppy, but it is a bow tie down, I'm sorry, bow tie up off of major, major lows. To me, this looks like it was about two years or a year and a half in the making. That's a pretty good bottom coming off of all these lows. Silver is a even better looking as far as overall sector. These are stocks now, not the actual commodities. These are the actual stocks, but looking pretty good. And as you can see, silver kind of banged out some new marginal new highs today. Okay. So silver and gold looking pretty good. Uh, banks have been looking great as of late. And I don't want to bore you and go through too many sectors, but for the most part, you know, today notwithstanding, most areas look pretty darn good. Most areas remain in longer-term uptrends and at or near new highs. And that's not a big shocker. The Russell was at new highs, all-time highs yesterday. The P's were just off of all-time highs yesterday. And the NASDAQ is just off of uh, multi-year highs. So for the most part, sector action looking pretty good. Okay. 
Okay, let's open it up for stock questions. Let's get Ford out the way for Mr. Don. Oh, before we do that, take a look at uranium. I've been a bull in uranium for quite a while. Uh, now, keep in mind, this is kind of a wild and crazy sector, but it does look like a bottom is in place here. And again, like I said, I've been a bull in uranium, so I think it's uh, bottomed out. But uh, uranium stocks could be very dangerous and wild and crazy to, uh, to trade, but I think a bottom is in place there for sure. Let's take a look at uh, Ford for Don. Ford is a big, thick stock that I generally don't like. It's retraced back up into this uh, prior consolidation. I would leave the stock alone unless it gets past this consolidation. It, can be, it begins to take off and pull back. Okay. All right, Steve. Check you later. What do you think about URZ? Yeah, ironically, I was just talking about uranium. URZ. URZ looks pretty good. We looked at it a while back, and we had a lot of overhead supply. And I said, if it cleared that overhead supply, then it might be viable. So it is a little wide and loose and crazy longer term. Okay, we had a good ride in this one a few years ago. Uh, but now that it's breaking out past this shorter term overhead supply, and the uranium stocks look like the real deal this time, okay? So, yeah, on a pullback, uh, that might be uh, certainly worthwhile. China stocks seem to be especially weak today. Does that mean anything? No. No, and you have to look at everything. I look at the EFA shares, which is uh, shares outside of North America. Uh, not every day, but occasionally I look at what I call the EW shares, Spain, Italy, um, and all these other indices and indexes. Uh, I actually have some charts that are set up to, just specifically to do that, and I do that maybe once a week or so. Um, but it's a piece of the puzzle, and everything's a piece of the puzzle. So does it mean anything? Well, it means something, okay, but does it mean we're going to roll over? No. Um, it means that maybe that piece of the puzzle, at least today, is not, is not working. And if you get more and more pieces of the puzzle not working, or let's just say negative, if, if um, more and more areas begin to roll over, then that might be cause for concern. But, yeah, just mark it down, and you you got your plus column, you got your minus column, okay, your plus column, biotech, health services, uh, resorts and casinos, uh, defense, and, you know, transport. So this goes on and on at or near new highs. On your minus column, consuming on durables, retail. I mean, even like the REITs, which have been looking like crud, are now pretty much going right back up, okay? So... So far, things look pretty good. Today is notwithstanding is an ugly day. Okay, John wants to know about ORMP. I'm going to like it, but there's going to be some caveats. ORMP. The caveats are going to be that it's going straight up. Okay, and this is one I've been showing in my Landry list. This is actually a little too extreme. Notice that the HV is 100 and let's say 60 round numbers. That's a pretty big HV number. More importantly, though, it went from Seven round numbers to 30-something. So that's like a 400% increase or almost a 400% increase. Yeah, 400% increase. So it's just too far, too fast, okay? It, it, yes, it's pulled back. And, I, you know, but Dave, you say, what did that take the chart out? And if you do that, okay, that looks pretty good, okay? But it's been such a massive run. It's so darn volatile. I think you could get into a lot of trouble trading it. So I would avoid that stock. But I hear you. It's definitely a momentum stock, and it definitely has pullback, John. So good eye on that one, but be darn careful, okay? Long gummo, but looks like I might get stopped out, Howard, okay? Long gummo. Well, it depends on where your stop is. I mean, your stop should probably be down below this base somewhere. And it looks like today it's kind of uh, come back up, so... I wouldn't get too excited about that, but hey, don't don't worry about it. Uh, you know, it's it's don't worry about it. Okay, I know it's easier said than done, but don't worry about it. You get stopped out, so what? You're gonna make another thousand, maybe two thousand trades over your career. So don't worry about it. And I wouldn't worry about it because it's already starting to turn around today. Okay, if anything, it looks like it wants to go back up. So don't worry about it. A U M N. A U M N. Yeah, that's going to be a little bit on the thin side. That is a metal, okay? 
and it's uh, it's called industrial metals and minerals, but it's also called golden minerals. So I'm wondering what type of minerals are they mining? But yeah, that looks like there could be a longer term bottom in this one. Now it's a penny stock, so a lot of caveats uh, in here. But look at how beautiful that bow tie is, and it's coming off of all time lows. Okay, now. Last time you had it tried to bow tie. By the time the bow tie completed, what happened? The stock was already selling off again. In fact, the bow tie completed here. Stock's already in a downtrend. So that would not have been a legitimate signal. Okay. This right here, that is what I call a major, 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 major signal. Okay. It's got a few bad memories along the way, but maybe they're high enough up to where it doesn't matter. So yeah, on a little bit of a pullback, this one might be worthwhile. It is thin, especially when you factor in the price of the stock and multiply it times the volume. It's a pretty darn thin stock. But, yeah, absolutely. That looks like a stock that has bottomed out. Who gave me that? I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a high five. It's not set up, but I'm going to give you a high five. Plug, P-L-U-G. First high five of the day, P-L-U-G. Uh, this is another one. This is what I call a bit of a bottle rocket now. It's going straight up in here. It went from 150 to 450. It's just too dangerous to trade. Now it's coming all the way back in. It looks even worse than uh, ORMP. If you were lucky enough to maybe play this last little pullback in here, um, well, you'd probably be stopped out by now, but you certainly want to honor your stops if you were. Okay. Is WTF setting up, setting a short position? WTF. Watiago. WTF. WTF. Oh, I'm not showing that as a symbol. You you had the right symbol? <laughs> we are WTF on WTF. <laughs> I think Tiago is in, um, in Portugal or South America, Brazil maybe. Do you know what uh, WTF is? Oh, WFT. <laughs> I didn't think there was a stock named WTF. Weatherford. Yeah, this stock's in trouble. Uh, your setup would have been back here, though. You had your first thrust down. You had your bow tie down. You had your first little pullback. Uh, it looks okay as a possible short, but the only problem is it's at relatively low levels. Okay, I would much prefer a transitional pattern off of high levels. So if we do get in the market that begins to crack a little bit, I mean, that's why I take a look at like GME, okay, from the trading service. And the reason we went out to GME was because notice you had a bow tie off of all-time highs, okay? So this stock has a long ways to go should it continue to work out, whereas some of those other stocks that are lower levels, they don't have as far to go. I mean, this could easily be a $20, $30 stock. could make a 100% retrace back to where it was started. But some of those other stocks, if they're at lower levels, then how far can they really go, okay? So you want to short them at, um, at higher <laughs> a year in Brazil, okay, but you speak Portuguese, right? OXF, OXF for Mr. Phil. Yeah, that looks like a stock that's bottoming out. Let's zoom in a little bit. Yeah, there's another metals and mining. This looks fantastic, okay? You can see it's bottomed out in here. You got your bow tie off of all-time lows. You see, that's why I really wanted to show you those bow ties, okay? For one, God forbid, our market rolls over and we get a bow tie down. But number two, and more importantly, we got all these metals out there making these nice looking bow ties, okay? Now, here's the problem. I did not notice how thin this stock is. This stock is so thin, it would be way too dangerous to trade. As an individual trader, you could, you could trade it if you want. I know that, okay? And sometimes you can exploit these inefficiencies. But this is a little bit extreme here. It's uh, less than, what, 100,000 shares a day, if that much. So I'd be careful with that one. Okay, James wants to know about Netflix and FLX. Well, you got a big gap uh, today, so there's really nothing you could do with that. Um, I would leave it alone. Let's back the chart way out. Yep, I didn't realize it was back to new highs in here. Uh, no, I'd leave it alone. I'm not a big, huge fan. I mean, this stock is so darn thick. It's a little bit uh, crazy. And it's got, see, I had a crazy day back here. I don't know what happened there. And another crazy day. Um, but, you know, maybe if this stock goes on to make another bow tie down, then it could be the mother of all uh, sell signals. What is your opinion about the RSI 2 method presented yesterday? Uh, I am not a fan. Uh, yesterday, um, uh, Tiago was in a, 
in a webinar uh, where I stopped in to um, chit chat. And uh, the webinar was on RSI 2. I am not a fan of indicator based systems like that. I'm not a fan of short term systems. Um, my problem with the short term system is your gains are, are not, uh, you don't have the potential for unlimited gains and you still have the potential for big losses. Uh, you could still get hit fairly hard. So I'm just not a big fan of short term systems. I'm not a big fan of using something like that uh, to identify pullbacks. I prefer just looking at a lot of charts. So yeah, okay. Eric says, your money management is fantastic. Thank you, Eric. Checks in the mail. Uh, by taking partial profits, I don't mind as much when the market corrects. Less to stress about and look forward to new setups. Yeah, you know, if you're if the market corrects and you've already taken partial profits, then you don't have that huge position on, okay? And it sucks. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it flat out sucks. You're losing money. But at least you're losing open profits on those ones that you've already taken partial profits on. And again, it sucks, but so what? You know, you're gonna have to be willing to give out some of those open profits, and that's the chart I show. Uh, I use CLDX, uh, the one we showed earlier in the presentation, because it was up 25 percent, then it was up 4 percent, then it was up 40 something percent, then it was up 20 percent, then it was up 50 or 100 percent, then it was up 50 something percent, and then it was up 200 percent, and then we got stopped out at 152 percent. Well, 152% gain on a net-net basis is much better than a poke in the eye. So you have to be willing to give up some of those open profits. And if you're taking partial profits along the way, then it kind of mitigates the damage on those days when you do have a big down day like today. Don wants to know about CLF. <clears throat> uh, that looks like a stock that's in a lot of trouble. But I bet it's at low levels. Let's back the chart way out. Yeah, it's at low levels. So, you know, this is a case of why would you want to short this stock? You, you short it because it's going to go what, back to old lows here, okay? Your short setup would have been right here when you had that bow tie off of triple tops, off the major, the mother of all tops, okay? And it had another bow tie prior to that that sold off a little bit. So, I mean, this was a major top. It took about six months to make. So that, that would have been your short. Now... It's no longer a short way down here. In fact, most of the metals are looking pretty good, so you need to dig a little deeper uh, on that. How would you trade a daily bow tie on HLF? HLF is a crazy stock. That's going to be Herbalife. This stock is just crazy. Um, as long as I've known this stock, it's been crazy. I mean, it just has these huge down bar days, and then it's just all over the place. So how would I trade it? I wouldn't. I would leave the stock alone. But I hear you. You had a first thrust down, okay? And you had a little bit of a pullback, and then today you have the mother of all shorts trigger. I think we talked about this one last week, but I would leave it alone just because it's such a crazy stock. But, yeah, there's a stock that's in trouble. Absolutely. All right, Barry, check you later. Thanks for coming. What about you, 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 you? Well, what about you? <laughs> you, 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 you. Um. I don't know what this bad tick is all about here, okay? Uh, it's very thin, less than 50,000 shares daily. Let's back the chart out. So you got another bad tick back here or something, so it's kind of got some bad issues with it. Uh, it's trying to bottom out, but it's too thin to really to really uh, go after, okay? And, again, you got this crazy little tick in there. So I would leave that alone unless the volume begins to pick up to a point where it's not such a thin stock, okay? Just too dangerous, Calvin. Uh, OXF, that's going to be a big, thick stock, I think. Um, oh, no, that's what we just talked about. Yeah, that one's okay. It's not quite set up yet. I mean, I guess it's set up if you use just a, just a lower high on your bow tie. But, yeah, it's really, really thin. ASML? I didn't read the whole question. Is it short? No, because it's just going, it's just sideways, and it's just wide and loose. It's all over the place. Uh, you're short. Let me back the chart way out. And I did see this one. I didn't get too excited about it because you had a first thrust here, and then you kind of had a first thrust or another first thrust type of, you know, your short would have been back here, 
or back here off the all-time highs. But now it's kind of wide and loose. It broke down. It came all the way back into its range. So leave that one alone. Okay. F Tech. Uh, no, it's just going sideways lately. So there's nothing to do there. If you're long, stay long. But there's nothing to do with that one. Okay. We're trading the short side. Connect which goes zero. Okay, yeah, we talked about that one. Okay. Angie for Angie for Don. It looks like it's bottoming out. It's coming off of eh, fairly significant lows in here. Uh, I'd give it a maybe. Uh, it's got some bad memories, and it just doesn't really jump out at me. Uh, I'd much it, it, it metals and mining are more choppy even, but uh, or even a, I should say even in a choppy sector like metals and mining, you've got some cleaner setup setting up. So maybe so. Love the stories. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry about it. What do you mean? Don't worry about it. Well, just don't worry about it. There's nothing you could do. <laughs> don't worry about it. Deck. Deck looks like it's in trouble. That's a consumer non-durable. Okay. Uh, you can see here's the beauty of, uh, and this is a uh, this is something you really ought to write down and, and pay attention to. And we'll go back and look at the GME because it was a simple, similar pattern. You had a marginal new high, which was just past this prior little high in here. So that's kind of hints of a double top. And then you had like a micro first thrust. And then now you've got a bow tie, which would have triggered right in here. Okay. So that's a stock that looks like it's in a whole lot of trouble. Take a look at like the GME. Remember, you had this marginal new high right after this high right here. So it's lost steam by going sideways. But at a new high, everybody feels good. Like, ooh, it feels good to be long. I'm making all this money. The water is good. Come on in, okay? Buy coal on a pullback. All right, let's see. Let's take a look at that. Uh, sure, why not? Um, I'm not a huge fan of trading REITs. Notice the HV is a little, little light on here at 19. That's kind of low. Uh, but yeah, I hear you on a pullback. I certainly can't argue with that. Okay. KKD for Phil. Have you ever been to a Krispy Kreme? Oh, it's like a religious experience. They have like these, these donuts and they go, they go through like this fountain of sugar. It's, oh, it's beautiful. I, had, I haven't had a donut in years, but, oh, I could go for one. I had some beignets not too long ago. Whenever somebody visits from out of town, we always go get beignets. It's a, that's my excuse to ingest some serious carbs. Uh, it just looks broken. Uh, I don't think I would short it now. But, yeah, it looks broken. It looks like it's going to head down to maybe the mid-teens mid, uh, mid -teens in here, or low-teens, I should say. But I leave it alone. I, I don't like stocks after they make a huge gap down. Uh, they tend to just kind of chop around afterwards. If you're short, stay short, though, okay? We have one a mile away in London. Oh, Phil, when I visit, uh, we're going to go to Krispy Kreme. That'll be my excuse to go get some carbs. Oh, man, it's just it's just a beautiful thing. Uh, yeah, this is stock in trouble. Like I said earlier, restaurants are in trouble. I'm not a huge fan of stocks that have a big gap up, but it looks like that's kind of uh, uh, negated by the fact that it's already kind of closed that gap. So, yeah, if this thing begins to rally a little bit, then look for a short. And also notice it's a little stealthy in here, but you do have a bow tie set up right bam, there, okay? So the combination of those things, and a bow tie tells you the stock may have rolled over, but hell, heck, all you got to do is just look at the stock and see that it looks like it's rolled over. This is going to be a tremendous amount of overhead resistance, okay? So, yes, on a bit of a bounce, you have the pot potential for the mother of all shorts there. Mark wants to talk about Jern. I forget if it's a bear or... Hebert, I think it's a bear, a bear. Um, no, buddy, it's just going sideways in here. There's nothing to really do there. I'm not going to Nicholas fine you um, on that one, but it's, it's sideways. There's no action there. You know, you don't want to trade. Why would you trade Jern, which is a biotech stock? When you take a look at biotech all, overall, take a look at the IBB, which is representative of the Nasdaq biotech stocks, and it looks like that. Look at that beautiful persistent trend. So. Um, I've been saying Tarzan. I guess it's Frankenstein. You know, that good, uh, that bad, sideways, okay? So let's go back to uh, IBB. 
So that good, okay? Nice persistent uptrend there. So if the overall sector looks like that, you should – let's take the chart out. The sector looks like that. You should find some stocks that look a lot like that within the sector, okay? Draw your, li draw your lines. Draw your arrows. A-R-I-A. Uh, no, it's just sideways, okay? We just talked about biotechnology going straight up, okay? Biotechnology looks like that. ARIA looks like that, okay? Now, maybe if it breaks out to new highs and then pulls back, yeah, I hear you. It might be uh, worthwhile, but no. Oh, it's got this big old gap back here. All right, let's, let's whip out Nicholas. No. Short ice for Alvin. I see. Good to see a lot of my peeps in here today. Give me a shout out there, Ivan. Yeah, that looks good. There's a possible short. Uh, strong sell off here. You got a tiny bit of a bounce. Uh, ideally, it'd be great if you had a bigger bounce, but sometimes on the short side, you get a tiny bounce. Um, looks like you might have some support around 180. That might be a good problem to have. But, yeah, it looks like a stock that could be done in here. It's also it could be priced for perfection. You can see it's up here at these all-time highs. It had a pretty good run, okay? What's the max count of positions you have open at one time? I don't believe it's good for normal human to track more than 25. Do you agree? Yeah, 25 would be a crazy number. Um, you know, we, when we start getting to the high teens, I start getting a little nervous. I want to uh, – ideally, you want to see as many of them hitting that initial profit target as possible, okay? Uh, how many do we have on now? Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We got eight on, okay? And out of those eight, we've got one, two, three, four, which have hit the initial profit target. Ideally, I'd like to see maybe five or six. I mean, ideally, I'd like to see all eight hit the initial profit target. I'd feel a little bit better, okay? Uh, I'm not as concerned about giving up open profits as I am about new losses, okay, because it's just kind of a necessary evil part of the business. But, yeah, you know, I don't see – what happens is, okay, you start putting them on, putting them on, putting them on, and if you're not getting profit targets hit, then you need to really think long and hard before you put on that ninth position or a tenth position or an eleventh position. You might want to say, wait a minute, okay, I'm putting on all these positions – over the last three weeks because I think the market's going higher because I'm getting these long side setups. But wait a minute, they're not working out. What does that tell me? Well, that might be telling you that the market is not following through. So before you put on that, that 9, 10, or 11 position, what you do is you say, okay, wait a minute. Let me make sure I really, 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 really like this position. And if the market starts getting choppy and you got a lot of positions on, like I said earlier with the ebb and flow, you'll start getting taken out of some, or at the least you won't see any new ones. So it will start self-regulating. But it seems to me like whenever you get close to those double digits and positions, uh, things begin to unfold to where uh, I, I don't get see many more than, than 10 positions on. Okay, But, yeah, high single digits, I want to see a lot of profit targets being hit if that's the case. M O N T M O N T. I am in from IPO Logic at sixteen fifty. Sixteen fifty. Um, I think I might do a Nido service. I think it would be just from the research I've done. I think it. it, it the only problem is there'd be times when uh, it wouldn't be uh, so great, and and you wouldn't have any IPOs, and it wouldn't be nothing to do. It'd be like. I come in every day and say, okay, sit on your hands. <laughs> um, you long from 16 and a half. I've taken off half. Where would you place a stop at the second half? Well, you want to give it a lot of rum. It looks like it's a pretty uh, wide, uh, you know, maybe it's four down as 20. Because if it pulls back to that level, that's your prior base. So, yeah, I have a stop in place there. All right. CTRL. CTRL for Mr. Wynn. Um, that's a little crazy. The, the, this bar is a little, it jumped from 20 to 30-something over a short period of time. 
it's on the cusp of being a little bit too crazy. But if it pulls back, I might consider it. But I just don't like the fact that this it just made this quantum leap higher. It you know stocks tend to kind of chop around. They'll make a quantum leap and then they'll just kind of chop around afterwards. Okay, P E I X. That's going to be a crazy one. P E I X. Um, yeah, maybe on a pullback. But you know you got to realize that it's had a pretty good run in here. So based on the magnitude of this run, you'd want to see a fairly deep pullback before uh, looking to go long on that one. I'm going to have to speed it up. We've got a, we've got about a, 100 questions unanswered. PAG, PAG. Uh, yeah, it looks like a possible short. It could have a little support back here. I hear you, though. It's, it's thrust down. It's pulled back a little bit. Uh, you guys are smart because the reason I say smart because – if, if I do these shows a few years ago, you, nobody would ever ask about shorts. It was Everybody was long, long, long. And I think you have to learn how to play both sides of the market, even though I'd much rather not have to play the short side. Live, uh, yeah, on a pullback, maybe, okay? But that's another case where it sort of just melted up. Longer term, it's a little crazy. I, I'd probably leave that one alone. It's just too crazy longer term, okay? Oh, you're welcome, John. John says, I've had good luck with IPOs lately. Thank you for your help. I have my eyes on GLYC. Yeah, I've, I've, I've actually, I swore I would never write another book, but I, I actually started writing one about a year and a half ago. And uh, it's on stock selection, which we did the webinar on, as you know, a few months ago. And that's why I was able to launch a, launch a webinar uh, of that magnitude over such a short period of time. I think I announced about a month ahead of time because I had – year and a half worth of material and one of the chapters is just uh, on IPOs and the beauty of an IPO is they trade purely on emotions now for this one for me to get excited they would actually probably have to put in a serious rally and then maybe look to play a pullback along the way TNDM that's going to be diabetic something TNDM that's a recent IPO uh, yeah it looks okay um, I don't like the way it pulled all the way back to its prior little peak in here, but sometimes with these IPOs, you can be a little lenient. I'll, I'll give it an okay. I probably wouldn't trade it, but I can't fault you too much on that one. Too late to get in a short trip on C trip. C T R P. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, you missed your first leg down and all. It's kind of a crazy stock. I, I'd leave it alone. I hear you, though. It's in a lot of trouble. Absolutely. Still waiting for the book on Amazon. It's so backed up. Email me, Mark. I'll get you a PDF on that while you're waiting. No problem. Okay. Uh, Sean, I can't talk about that one. That is that is our recommendation as a short for today. So I'd like to give you a high five. Daylight's disappearing. Seems to me less risk here than buying at the top of the channel. Well, that's the other thing, too, is uh, because the methodology requires a pullback, we're going to have a bunch of longs going into tomorrow. Now, we're going to have to be very careful and not go long those setups unless we actually have uh, a trigger on those setups, okay? So, yeah, and then that's one thing. You know, the other couple nights ago, I said in my service, I wish the market would just go straight up, but then I corrected myself and said, you know, I, we tend to do a little bit better when the market just kind of plods along uh, and in general works its way higher uh, it, because we'd like to trade these inefficient stocks that could often move contra to the overall market. Something like an RLYP, relatively due issue, RLYP, okay. You know, it, it's did this move, okay, and then it's actually going up today. Well, kind of jinx that, but you can see. Something like that could make this inefficient move. And you can get a lot of these inefficient moves sometimes, even though the market just kind of plodding along, going sideways to higher. Look at what the S&P did, okay? In fact, we could uh, we could put it underneath here. Yeah, I apologize. We're not going to get to everybody today. We could, I'm sorry about that. Uh, let's see if we can put the uh, comparison invisible SP500. Okay, so this is the this is the S and P five hundred. You can see it's a top in here, and so the S and P five hundred didn't do anything, and then look at what this market did. So I, I recanted my 
saying that, I wish you'd go straight up. I mean, unless it's a 1999 situation, we'll just go straight up forever, okay? YCRW, Y has a short. Now, don't go crazy bearish. I know this stock. We were long not too long ago. Uh, no, it's kind of all over the place. And, you know, trucking just broke out to do highs a couple days ago. So, yeah, leave that alone. And it's at lower levels in here, fairly low levels. It's kind of it's kind of all over the place. You're welcome, Sean. Good eye. Okay. Okay. CML, CMLS. Would CMLS have violated your rules? Regarding length and depth of pullbacks I described earlier, as CMLS, CMS, yeah. Take your time, Dave. I'm trying to get as many questions in. Regarding length and depth of pullback, as you described earlier, has CMLS violated your rules? Yes. Okay. See, that becomes more of like a first thrust now. Remember we said these media stocks look like they're in trouble. It's pulled all the way back to this prior breakout levels and then some. Let's throw the bow tie moving averages in, and you can see that they're going to quickly catch up to the stock. So on a little bit of a bounce in here, this would actually be a short setup. It's no longer a pullback. When you pull back uh, below the prior base in here, it's a pullback. Well, look, we're out of time. Uh, thanks, everybody, for attending. Sorry to get to all the questions. Uh, to me an email, and I'll either uh, answer you directly or there'll be fodder for next week's show. We don't talk again. Everybody have a great weekend. Uh, if you get a chance, check, do check out the, t uh, the Stock Selection webinar, and at the least, Take a look at the free webinar I did on stock selection, and I talk a lot about this pullback to the prior base as negating a potential long setup, so that would be a good uh, way to check up on that. Anyway, everybody have a fantastic uh, weekend again, and we'll talk again, I guess, next week, if not sooner. Thank you so much.